pre-prepared slogans out of the way, we can actually have a real discussion now. The, the, the reality and the fact of the matter is... Was that one of yours? Uh, not, not really, Mike, actually. We're just going to have some fun tonight. Some tense moments on the stage during last night's first GOP debate, including that back and forth between Mike Pence and Vivek Ramaswamy and the former vice president pulling no punches as he hopes to boost his poll numbers out of the single digits. And the former vice president, Mike Pence, joins me now. Sir, good to have you. I I'm going to assume you think you did well. Thanks Do you for think me on. you did well enough to break out of this pack and get into double digits? Well, we've been encouraged by the response. And frankly, I, I, was, uh, uh, I was really honored to be on that stage, uh, to be able to talk about the fact that I really believe with all humility, based upon my years as a leader in the Congress, my years leading the state of Indiana as governor, uh, and, and my years, I think, as the leading conservative in the Trump-Pence administration, that I, I'm the most qualified, the most tested, the most proven conservative in this race, uh, and the opportunity to take that case to the American people. Uh, and to have an energetic uh, debate with others on the stage was something that I relished and, uh, and I'm grateful for. Energetic is one way to uh, describe what happened. You mixed it up with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. I want to play a bit of your criticism uh, of him and then ask about it on the other side. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. We don't need to bring in a rookie. We don't need to bring in people without experience. You say he's a rookie on the job uh, uh, training. Your last boss was a rookie. He had uh, on the job training, a businessman who had never been elected, who had no foreign policy experience. Why is it disqualifying for Vivek, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy and not for Donald Trump in 2016? Well, I think it's uh, we live in at a different time. I mean, uh, President Joe Biden is weak in this country at home and abroad, the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan has emboldened the enemies of freedom. We have war raging in Eastern Europe. China continues to menace in the Asia Pacific. And here at home, the runaway spending under the Biden administration launched the worst inflation in 40 years. Their war on energy has gasoline prices still up 60 percent. Their open borders policies created the worst border crisis in history. And I just wanted people to understand that I believe this is a time for proven and experienced leadership in Washington, D.C. I know how to get things done in Congress. I know the role of states, the vital role that our states play. And I know how an administration works. And uh, bringing all that experience to bear, frankly, it's the reason why my wife and I stepped into this race. Uh, it's because we believe that to whom much is given, much will be required. And we've been blessed with opportunities to serve this country. And uh, we just felt really a duty, Victor, to step forward and offer our experience to meet the challenges following the failed policies of Joe Biden and the Democrats in Washington. Let me play uh, what you told my colleague Dana Bash about uh, the former president uh, who was not on the stage last night, uh, Donald Trump, and uh, if he should be president again. Let's watch. I'm running for president in part because I think anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States never be president of the United States. However, when you were asked last night if you would vote for former President Trump, even if he's convicted uh, for president, you raised your hand. Reconcile those two. Well, look, every one of us on the stage signed a, a pledge to support the Republican nominee. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, uh, my hand was raised in that spirit, just in, in keeping my word, but... Uh, I really do believe more after last night uh, that Donald Trump is not going to be the Republican nominee. I know that many of you in the media think this is uh, already a rematch between Trump and Biden. I don't see that. I think last night the American people saw, hopefully, hopefully they got a better sense of me and my role as a leader over the last 20 years. But also I think they got a better sense of, uh, of what a deep bench the Republican Party has uh, and that we have, uh, we have better choices for 2024 for our party. So uh, I, I'm more confident than ever uh, that our party is going to give us a standard bearer fitted to the time, someone that's going to be able to lead us to victory in 2024. And I'm going to continue to work my heart out to make sure that's me. Let me ask you, uh, a few days ago, Lawrence Tribe and conservative uh, former judge uh, J. Michael Ludig uh, wrote an article for The Atlantic and argued, and here's the quote, the former president's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election and the resulting attack on the U.S. Capitol placed him squarely within the ambit of 
a disqualification clause, and he is therefore ineligible to serve as president ever again. We're talking about the 14th Amendment here. You consulted Judge Ludig uh, when you were uh, given the advice by John Eastman and others that you had the power to reject slates on January 6th. Do you agree with his conclusion that because of the president's actions uh, before and on January 6th, that he is disqualified from holding presidential the, the office again? Well, I, I really can't comment on on his, yes, his legal theory. Uh, look, I, I made it I made it clear last night that, you know, I hope that all hadn't come to this. I hope the judgments over the president's action in and around January 6th have been left uh, to the American people. I, I don't know whether uh, uh, whether the 14th Amendment applies. I'd read an article the other day that uh, uh, in the in the Justice Department's uh, pleading, they didn't even reference that kind of a charge. So I, I, I'm. I'm skeptical about that. But look, we'll make sure the president has his presumption of innocence. No one is above the law. But what I welcomed last night, and, and it took a little while for some people, uh, was for every aspirant on that stage to acknowledge that on January 6th, I did my duty under the Constitution of the United States. Frankly, uh, it's, it, for me, over the last two and a half years, uh, to have Donald Trump and his allies continuing to repeat the falsehood that I had the right to reject or return uh, votes, uh, uh, that no vice president in American history had ever claimed or ever should claim, uh, I, it has, uh, I, I think it's, it's really misled a great number of Americans. So having all the candidates on the field uh, affirm that, recognize that, uh, because I want people to know that on that fateful day, uh, whatever, the, whatever the process of these various cases uh, will be, uh, is that President Trump asked me to put him over my oath to the Constitution, but I chose the Constitution, and I always will. Our former Vice President Mike Pence, it was a, a late night. We thank you for waking up early and speaking with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Victor. Where do we start? First of all, that was a brilliant question on thank you. Rookie. Yeah. And he I didn't mean, answer it. If, if it's disqualifying for Vivek Ramaswamy, Donald Trump, he said, was ready on day one. And a rookie in the same way. In the which same way. Which is what's way. so interesting. And then the last question about the 14th Amendment and this argument from a legal scholar, renowned conservative legal scholar, that Pence relied on on January 6th. Mm -hmm. He kind of sidestepped that. There were that. both textbook examples of how these candidates feel like they are put in a straitjacket by the fact that they don't like Donald Trump, they don't believe Donald Trump should be president again, uh, and many of them don't back here think he's eligible to be president again, but... The only way they improve their numbers are to draw supporters away from Donald Trump, and they don't want to insult and challenge those voters. Mm -hmm. And so the, the vice president just said there, again, Donald Trump asked me to break the law, and I wouldn't do it. Right? He doesn't say it that plainly, but that's, if you translate, that's what he's saying. Donald Trump asked me to break the law and break my oath, and I refuse to do it. But then he won't say, this man should be, he should not be allowed near the White House, let alone through the gates and into the White House again. He won't say that part, because to, his only chance is Iowa. Ten years ago, he's a textbook Iowa candidate, Midwestern governor, Midwestern congressman, evangelical Christian, a textbook Iowa candidate. But the party has changed so much with Donald Trump as its leader. They are afraid. They, th they, they, they need those votes. And, and all of these candidates are wrestling with how do I convince these voters who are loyal to Donald Trump? Give it up. The problem with being branded as anti-Trump is it puts you at a political ceiling in this Republican kind of electorate. And so, yeah, there's a question of can he break out to get to a double digits to be a kind of alternative. Mm -hmm. But if you are someone who is branded as against the Trump movement and for, uh, and for lack of facts, that January 6th moment has set in for 30, 40 percent of that electorate. That causes a kind of uh, electoral ceiling and makes it a lot harder to cobble together a coalition. I think Pence did himself a lot of favors last night. It did his legacy favors, did his kind of message favors. like.